Hello. Welcome to this week's edition of the Turning Points Podcast. Today, we had the opportunity to speak to a very sweet gentleman, uh, Brent Beckfar, who was incredibly insightful. Uh, it was really fun for me to uh, watch your guys' you know, past history, the stories that you had, and some of the overlaps, and then some of... Uh, some of the gaps he's filled in. Um, there were a few uh, technical issues and some delay, but it was still really fun to just, uh, man, hear hear the depth of his experiences. Yeah, I know him, Another yet another friend from the Chopra Center many years ago. And uh, one of the Chopra people that was in the original, you know, he knows Sarah McLean and uh, Ariel Ford has been friends with Deepak for many years. And so he had lots of great stories. And so he was kind of connecting yeah. with the other people. So if you go back and listen to, you know, uh, you know, Ariel uh, Ford and, and Roger Gabriel and Sarah McLean's, you'll see the overlapping stories of when they all started together in Boston at Lancaster Institute. So uh, Brent Beckvart is a Jyotish astrologer, Vedic astrologer for the past 35 years. He's got a degree in psychotherapy. He's a yoga meditation teacher. And Sean and I are super excited to get Vedic astrology yeah. readings from him soon. It ignited me my interest in that. And uh, we had a fun conversation. So take a listen. Absolutely. Hello, Brent. Welcome to our podcast. Thank you, Corinne. Nice to be here. Glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, yeah it's been many years. I probably haven't seen you in person in at least 20 years, if not like 22 or 23 years. And um, it doesn't seem like any time's gone by, though, does it? <clears throat> totally agree. Yeah. <laughs> So, all right, so we'll dive right into our question of the podcast is, you know, many seekers can recall that point in time when they started to question their so-called reality or their conditioned beliefs. So do you remember when you became a seeker? Well, since I know, you know, you start with the, this question, I've been thinking about it a little bit today. I took a long walk on this ranch this morning. I was walking out among all the birds and the creatures and I feel like I'm living in a Disney movie here. It's incredible. But it's a wonderful question. <clears throat> it's a wonderful question to ask anyone. But as I was thinking about it, I realized that there were a number of points that I, I really had to consider to be pivotal pivotal um, in, in response to that question. Um, <clears throat> I mean, really, since the time I was a little kid, my mother who I mentioned had passed away last November at 97. She's a, was a deeply spiritual person, you know, really living her spiritual uh, experience every day. And she really kind of indoctrinated me into prayer, even as a small child. And so from an early age, I was, I always had a sense there was something bigger going on, you know, something bigger, something, you know, at the time I remember thinking it was up there, somewhere up there. And so uh, I, I was always very curious about where is it, you know, where is this divine thing that my mother used to talk about and that we would pray to. And, and I think as a result, I would have some really a, a kind of experiences i remember lying one one moment i was lying as a very small boy out in a field in the grass looking up at the clouds in the sky and i remember just feeling just this experience of light everywhere you know just that, that feeling that that whatever that that god was was everywhere and that it was you know in that moment uh full of the, the divine and um <clears throat> I was also thinking that, you know, I mean, we're, we're all musicians, all three of us. We, we established that, uh, uh, that you guys, I know you are, Kryn, and And I think from a very early age, music to me was a way of tuning in to, search, to, you know, different streams of consciousness. I think we've all had that experience. I think musicians are naturally inclined to do that, to tune in to different frequencies of of experience and of consciousness. So even as a little kid, I used to do that, even just all by myself, kind of imaginary, <laughs> you know, imaginary um, audience and singing to wh whomever, whatever. And I think that was, uh, has always been transformative for me in terms of waking, waking up to something more, that whatever we want to call that something more. Um, when I was about five or six, 
I, I, I don't talk about this very often because I don't really know how to frame it for people, but I think you guys will understand. Uh, when I was about five or six, I, I remember it was twilight and I happened to walk between some houses in the neighborhood where I was living, where, where my family lived. And I remember um, going kind of between these buildings and then coming out again, feeling that I've had, that I had had the, the most incredible experience that I could even imagine. I knew I'd been somewhere and what I called that somewhere was nowhere land. <laughs> I'd been to nowhere land and I don't, I don't, it was like a missing time experience that you hear people talk about. And I, I, it was one of those things where I knew I was, I went somewhere or was taken somewhere or where I had um, some kind of shift in my reality where I'd had the most incredible experience uh, and couldn't remember specifically what it was, but I knew I wanted to go back to nowhere land. <laughs> and I remember um, go, going to everybody I could find going, this is, I'm a little kid. I'm going, where is nowhere land? I've got to go back there. I, I was so, you know, um, I had such urgency and, and sincerity. People were trying to help me. They were, they would get out the, a map and, 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 and they, they found one, my one friend said, do you mean Norway, Norway? Here's Norway. I said, no, it's not nowhere land. I want to go. And I was, I couldn't believe nobody did. Nobody would, nobody knew what I was talking about, but you know, again, I think sometimes we have these experiences, even as children where we're learning something or we've been taught something or something has, um, has shifted for us and maybe even set the tone for, you know, later life, uh, things that happen later in life. Um, you know, my life was really turbulent after that. I think uh, growing up in the Catholic church, uh, you know, it was not such a good experience as it isn't for a lot of people. And so I think by the time I was 16 or 17, I had pretty much just, you know, uh, given that up. And it was about that time that a friend of mine, somebody I still see from time to time in the town where I grew up, really spiritual guy, introduced me to Edgar Casey. And I had the book, he gave me the book. Uh, I think it was called, um, not right now, I'm forgetting the title of it. It so was a book about ones. Edgar Casey, I believe. Yeah, yeah. yeah there, so many you, good ones. You've probably read some. Yeah. I don't think it was The Sleeping Prophet, which was written by somebody else. It might have been a book that he wrote. But anyway, boy, that 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 was the first thing I thought of when when uh, you asked me the question uh, was Edgar Casey, because then that just completely opened me up to recognizing that a lot of the things I suspected and thought about and really knew but didn't hear people talk about very much. Here was this guy from, and I grew up in Kentucky, Louisville, Kentucky, not far from Nashville. And so, you know, I didn't hear people talking about the things that I sort of knew about, and, you know, sensed, you know, and having, having sort of uh, real intuition and even sometimes uh, psychic experiences that, you know, people didn't really talk about but here was this guy, the sleeping prophet, who was from Kentucky. Edgar Casey was from a uh, little town in Kentucky. And man, that, that really opened up my whole world about, about you know, the things I knew were, were true, but hadn't really had any confirmation about. Uh, and, then, and then shortly after that time, uh, I happened to see a, a friend of mine's brother was... Um, practicing yoga. He was a little older than we were. And I happened to see him practicing yoga. And boy, that just switched on something in me. It was like a past life, you know, past life recognition. Because from that moment on, I had to learn what I could about yoga. I, I, I got, I asked him what book I could get. I think Richard Hittleman's book was the only book about yoga back then, R Richard Hittleman. And that's the one he maybe even loaned it to me. And eventually, you know, yoga became and still is a big part of my life. And um, 
uh, and I do feel like that was a stream of, you know, picking up the thread of a past life. And the same has been true with Vedic astrology for me. And you know, we can talk about that maybe later, but anyway, I hope that wasn't too long winded an answer uh, to your inquiry. <laughs> no, we're just getting started. That, that, that's perfect. I mean, that's, you know, when I, when we ask the original turning point, that's what we mean is when you're, the first time you start to remember, and that's different for everybody. Some people don't start to wake up until their twenties. Um, you know, mostly the people, what we interview, they, they do have childhood experiences, which I love to hear about. There's there, you know, most mm -hmm. seekers can recall something in their childhood. And then of course, as you said, there's many, many more turning points. Like one girl called it a bouncing ball, you know, following the bouncing ball of life, which I really like. And um, mm -hmm. so, so, so yeah, I, I, we both of both Sean and I just love this conversation of where, did, where would, where did the, you know, did spirit take you next? You know, what was the next thing? So by all means, this is about you. I mean, Sean and I go try not to go off on too many tangents when we're interviewing people, but it does happen. But, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no. So, so what next? Like that was when you were a teenager. And then, so in your twenties, you know, where did yoga take you next? Like, tell us. Well, um, around, uh, age 20, I moved to Colorado. I went, I transferred from the school I was, college I was going to in the South to Boulder, University of Colorado. And I was drawn to a yoga class, the Interval Yoga Institute, which was, um, this was in Boulder. In Boulder that summer, that previous summer of 1969, they there was something called the holy man jam in Bo in boulder i don't know I, I i'd love to go back and find out who organized that because a lot of the you know teachers that we knew about and heard about and were influenced by from that time you know yogi bhajan and swami satchidananda who became my my guru and um god there's so many more you know chogyam trungpa rinpoche came shortly after that and established began eventually to establish uh, Naropa, the Naropa Institute. He came from West Virginia, which is where the other place, Tale of the Tiger was. And people like that, Maharishi even came uh, eventually. He wasn't, I don't think, part of that group, but there were many, many teachers that came, Buddhists and um, Vedic uh, teachers and people from this one fellow, Charles Berner, I remember was, had started something called abilitism and he had been a kind of a higher level uh teacher and and participant in scientology apparently and he broke off you know and I, that was a big thing to break off i guess at that time from scientology they sent people after him and he <laughs> it was pretty pretty tough time for him uh but he eventually he was so he was so clear on what he wanted to do and he would do these enlightenment intensives in boulder and so there were a lot of people like that that had been been there that summer so the the whole atmosphere of boulder was really just uh i mean boulder's a pretty special place anyway i don't know if you all have been there have you yeah, I mean, it's 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 it, the Vastu of Boulder is really kind of extraordinary where it's set right up against the 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 flat irons there in, in the base of the Rocky Mountains. And anyway, uh, uh, it just vibrated with um, with uh, spiritual vitality and, and excitement around those things. So anyway, I made a, I made my way to a yoga ashram and became completely immersed in practice. At, a, at the age of 21 and very quickly uh, became a teacher there. Um, and this was, start, you know, Swami Satsadananda. I don't know if you know who he was. You probably do, don't you? Oh, he, yes. was, um, he was such a beautiful teacher. And I'm, I'm so grateful I knew him when he was alive and had the benefit of his uh, his influence. But but I was initiated by him into Japa and and he even did that Shaktipat thing, you know, put his finger right there. And that, that was, you know, <laughs> that was pretty extraordinary. Uh, and I taught, I taught for a while there and then, you know, continued teaching yoga for many years after that, even at, at the Chopra Center where 
where you and I've met, Corinne, uh, when we first moved to from uh, Massachusetts, Deepak, Roger, Sarah, and um, Clinton Horner, and I forget who else Clinton, came from. Yeah. Yeah. We, 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 we'd all been in Massachusetts, prob- probably Mary, Clinton's first wife. Um, but um, anyway, we, we moved out there and I, I, my job was to direct the residential program, which we, we had at the Loberge Hotel in Del Mar. Um, it was, that, was, that was a phenomenal thing, how that all happened. That was, I don't, that's too much of a story probably, but. No, 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 no. Tell us, tell was, us. This is good. That was really an experience of being guided somehow. Um, you know, we've all had those experiences of just being guided. We're not sure how that happens, but uh, we had come out there uh, to establish the Sharp Center for Mind Body Medicine with Sharp Sharp Healthcare, a large, um, you know, hospital corporation in San Diego. Um, Peter Ellsworth was the CEO and, and uh, he had really gotten interested in Deepak through his wife, through Ellsworth's wife. Um, and she, um, Doris was her name, Doris Ells- Ellsworth. And anyway, so um, David Simon, Dr. Simon, who was uh, a neurologist at Sharp Healthcare was, um, was had been you know a TM teacher had been a student of Mari. She had studied Ayurveda uh, with Deepak and had gotten to know Deepak. And I'm speaking of Deepak Chopra here. Uh, and they had become acquainted. And David had somehow convinced um, Peter Ellsworth to uh, create a, a center for mind body medicine. This was in 1993 in uh, San Diego. So. You know, this, this, and this is right at the beginning of when Deepak, his, he was a rising star, you know, at that point. And, and I often use his Vedic astrology chart to illustrate how people can become rising stars when certain planetary yogas occur in their Vedic chart. It's, it's a fascinating thing to see. Raja yogas, they're called. Well, Deepak really was, he had, he had, uh, during shortly before I came to work for him, him in Massachusetts, he had gone into the Jupiter period, and maybe a little later we'll talk Vedic astrology. But the Jupiter period is a it's a big deal for uh, in, in India. You know, it's called Guru Dasha. The word for Jupiter in Sanskrit is Guru, means remover of ignorance. So Jupiter is the great benefic planet, which is we say the deliverer of grace and the planet that draws us toward consciousness. So that's why Jupiter is associated with religion, philosophy, higher knowledge, and dharma. So when people go into the Jupiter period, they often start to have these spontaneous awakenings and things really start to change in their lives. Well, when Deepak went into the Jupiter period, when he was about 43, um, suddenly, and he'd been, you know, uh, very busy working as a physician in Boston. He was chief of staff at New England Memorial, I believe he was. Um, really stressed out. He acknowledges when he talks about that time, he was drinking highballs to go to sleep and a lot of coffee to stay awake and even smoking cigarettes. Well, right around this Jupiter period, suddenly everything shifted. And I think because of the level of stress, he actually, one of his nurses, I believe, suggested that he learn to meditate. And through, I don't remember the the, the exact um sequence of events, but somehow he went to hear Maharishi speak. And it's a fascinating story because they met in a very kind of uh, synchronistic way out in the hall before Maharishi was going in to speak and Deepak happened to be walking in late. And, you know, it was one of those moments of recognition where the, the guru and the student, you know, it's like the, the spark plug, you know, and, so Maharishi knew who Deep. I mean, he didn't. Deepak wasn't well known or anything at, at that time, of course. But Maharishi recognized this person that Deepak was, this this soul that Deepak was, and and through a series, interesting series of um, meetings, uh, Deepak first of all learned to meditate, learned TM at that time, transcendental meditation. He um, 
he be, began to have these conferences with Maharishi and, and things just unfolded from there. And eventually Deepak was being sort of groomed, you might say, to, to um, be the, you know, the spokesperson for the TM organization. He was already speaking, doing many lectures. He, you know, he had such charisma and he had such, he was so articulate and so uh, knowledgeable as a medical man and brilliant as we know. But so uh, anyway, he wrote a book called uh, uh, Perfect Health with an, several other physicians involved, I guess, with the TM organization, which was really kind of a, a, a treatment more to do with Ayurveda and mind-body connection. And um, so anyway, gradually, because of this Jupiter period I'm speaking of, where, where you know, the word for Jupiter is guru, and it often happens in, in when somebody goes into a Jupiter period that they meet uh, that they meet a significant teacher. They they often seek out spiritual systems and uh, spiritual teachers, and even sp learn spiritual techniques like meditation. I see it happen all the time. Hmm. So he was real, and and this planetary yoga that Jupiter created with several other planets in Jupiter in Deepak's chart, very powerful yoga. He had to rise up. He had to become known. And his book, you know, through the Oprah Winfrey show, of course, became, and his in interview with her became a best, inter you know, international bestseller. And his, you know, he was launched. Uh, so anyway, back to San Diego and Del Mar, that was right around the time we moved there. And, and David had invited Deepak to come and be part of this and actually to be the director of this mind body center that had sharp had agreed to sponsor. So that was a big, and maybe when you spoke to Roger, he talked about that, but th that was a, a real difficult time for Deepak because he, he had to break away from Maharishi and the TM organization. He felt at, at that time that he was too restricted in what he could talk about. And he felt, I mean, he, you have to believe Deepak was just knowing him. He was just so full of inspiration. He had to get out and do more. So here was the opportunity for him at this uh, Mind Body Center. Am I talking too much? By the way? No, Brett, it's, it, <laughs> it's like so this. awesome. What what I, I will share with you, like we've hear, heard pieces of this story from Ariel um, and pieces of this story from from Sarah and pieces from Roger, and you're just filling in the stuff that we haven't heard yet. So it's just like so oh, perfect, um, you know. And you know where I was, just as a side note, I was in 1993 when you guys were there and Deepak was making this big decision. I was at Gallaudet University with the TM organization doing 30 days with the Transito, with their big organization study, three months of everybody meditating yeah. eight hours a day. I was there getting my cities. And they read a letter that said, do not buy Deepak Chopra's books. Do not follow him. Mm -hmm. And I was like, fuck that. And I was <laughs> like, I, I, that's, a, that's yeah, as far as I went with the, with the TM. And then, you know, but anyway, so that I was just had to share that too at the same time where I was. So, okay. So continue the, the San Diego because we haven't heard this part yet or whatever you want to share. When that letter came out, um, I was still uh, at the Maharishi Ayurveda Health Center in, in Lancaster. Roger had already moved to San Diego. I was supposed to come in two months, but at, the t at that time, I'd been given the job of being the acting director at this center. So I was actually in, the, in a supervisory role there, kind of holding the place together until the new the administrators could come in two months. So in the meantime, I was getting uh, calls from the national office, the TM office, to take all of Deepak's books out of the center, put them, lock them up in a closet and, you know, not to make any more references to him. And it was really shocking, you know, because Deepak was the reason that I was there. He was the reason I'd come to work at, at the Lancaster Center, which was his center. And that he had really developed, you know, as part of the TM organization. I mean, he he will readily acknowledge all his uh, appreciation and gratitude to Maharishi. But, you know, like many spiritual organizations, you know, things get uh, uh, 
personalities, egos take over. There's a hierarchy, there's control, there's all kinds of things going on. So anyway, I was really ready to leave at that point, but I had to wait until somebody came. I'd been also, I, I, I had been trained as a meditation teacher by Swami Satsadananda, but I was in training as a, to be a TM teacher in Cambridge at that time, Cambridge, Massachusetts. So I was going every week uh, and really wanted to kind of finish that training, but I, 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 I and almost got to the, the end of it before I had to leave the, um, I had to report to the physician who was in charge of Lancaster, Jay Glazer was his name, that I was going with Deepak. And he said, you know, I kind of knew that was going <laughs> to happen. I remember he was really cool about it at the time. I thought he was going to, I thought it was going to be another horrible thing because Deepak really went through a very difficult time. You know, he was just really cut off. Uh, everybody in the team organization thought he had, was a traitor. And I mean, it was really so deeply painful for Deepak because he knew and loved a lot of these people. And uh, he was just trying following, you know, his own, uh, guidance. I mean, the guidance that he was being given, and I think he was, you know, right to do it. But, but anyway, it was quite a quite a time. That whole time was really a lot going on. I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued to know that you were there and one of those people, because I remember when that letter came out. Anyway, so uh, we were teaching TM at the uh, at the new center uh, at Sharp Hospital, and I'll, I'll tell you briefly the story. <laughs> <laughs> Roger would probably laugh if you heard this because when I, when I came, I, I did finally came out from Massachusetts. I drove all the way and got there, and I was supposed to be uh, directing this uh, mind, this mind body residential program at at. at um, and Roger had been negotiating with the Marriott hotels for our center to be at one of the Marriott hotels in. San Diego, the Marriott Mission Valley, it was called. And so when I arrived, you know, Roger took me and I kind of think Sarah might have been with us. I don't know. I asked her about this recently. I don't think she remembers it. But there was another woman. I thought Sarah was part of this. So Roger takes us to this um, uh, Marriott Mission Valley. And it's like in the middle of all these highways. And, you know, this is after we came from this beautiful um, you know, mansion, really, this, uh, the TM organization owned in Lancaster, beautiful Georgian mansion on 200 acres of woods, and it's gorgeous there. And I'm looking at all these freeways in San Diego, and uh, it was just all these people down below by the pool, and I'm thinking, this is never going to be a re retreat. This can't be a retreat. But Roger had been, you know, working really hard to to negotiate this with the Marriott Corporation and and we were going to be doing some of our courses there too you know at the in the ballrooms and he'd been you know really working hard on all this so I was so depressed after I saw this I remember leaving there with these two other ladies that that were also there I think Sarah was one of them and we were going to drive somewhere to have lunch and I'm just like thinking to myself, I, I, maybe I should go back to Massachusetts. I just, this is never going to work. I was so depressed. And so we we ended up going to Del Mar and we were having lunch at this. Actually, I got lost. I was going to Solana Beach, took a wrong turn. <laughs> I love that part. <laughs> and um, which turned out to be the perfect turn because we ended up in Del Mar and we had lunch uh, at the in this place called the Plaza at this restaurant called Episodes, looking out at the at the ocean in Del Mar, a beautiful spot. And we're, right in front of us is the Del Mar is the uh, Loberge Hotel. And I'm looking at this, and I'm talking to one of the women who was with us. She was an attorney, and I said, who lived in, uh, nearby, and and she, kind of place we need to have. That's the kind of place we need to be for this program. And she goes, oh, don't even think about it. This is the Loberge, it's um, it's managed by the Bel Air Hotel. You know the Bel Air Hotel. It's a very, you know, very exclusive place. Expensive. You know, don't even think about it. Something compelled me to to say, look, after lunch, I said, let's just go down there and look at it. I don't know what, you know, motivated me to do that. So we went down. It was a Saturday. And the and I went to the front desk and I said, you know, is I 
guess I asked if the sales manager was there. <laughs> I don't even know how I knew to do that. But yes, he happened to be there. He's working on a Saturday. He came out and I introduced myself and the other ladies that were with me. And, uh, and he knew who Deepak was. He'd heard of Deepak. And I said to him, oh, and, and an important detail here, Roger had had actually gotten a contract from the Marriott for a certain price per room per day, which was pretty low. I think it was like $50 a, a night per room for 30 rooms and other things and catering and various things. So it was a pretty, you know, pretty, he'd, he'd done a good job negotiating with them. <laughs> but so I said to the sales manager, look, we're, we're about to sign a contract next Tuesday. This was Saturday uh, at, with another hotel here in, in town for, and I told him, I said, 30 rooms for, you know, a year or two years. I don't, I don't remember what I said to him, but I laid it all out. I said, we need catering for so many people. And I could, I could just see the wheels turning and he's thinking about his commission <laughs> for, <laughs> for this, if he can, if he can swing this. So, I said, if you can match this, um, you know, this deal that we have, but I didn't tell him what the uh, what the other hotel was. Uh, if you can match this, I we'd like to, and I don't know what gave me the authority to do this, but I said we, you know, we would like to be able to have our program here. And so I said, but but I have to know tomorrow because Monday Deepak was coming back from some travel. And I needed to get him to look at this, the, you know, some information about this. So he says, well, I'll have to call the Bel Air uh, and I'll, let, I'll, I'll call you tomorrow at one o'clock. So, I, and of course, I'm, I'm really especially interested in this because I'm going to be living there. And I'd much <laughs> rather live at this Le Verge Hotel on the Pacific Ocean, you know, gorgeous property than, than the Marriott Mission Valley surrounded by freeways. <laughs> but, but I knew that the program would be so much better in this place. And, and I don't know what was, what it was that just kept moving me to do this. So next day he calls and says, they've agreed to do it for that same price per room. This was like ridiculous for these rooms at the Louberge. Uh Anyway, so I'm just elated and I'm thinking, great, D you know, Deepak's gonna love this. So I, I drive over to tell Roger, God bless Roger. He's worked so hard on this thing. And I went, and I said, Roger, you, you, you've got to come to see this hotel, the Lobert's hotel. You're not going to believe it. They've agreed to give us the same deal that you got with the Marriott. I thought he'd be thrilled. He goes, no, I'm not looking at any other hotels. <laughs> it's too far North. And he was anyway, I mean, I love Roger, and, and but he could be stubborn. And he would just, stonewalled me completely. He wasn't going to hear anything I had to say. He pretty much just said, nope, you know, just get out of here. I don't want to, I don't want to hear about it. I go out, I literally get in my car, start to drive up the freeway. And I'm just, I am just so something just took over. I said, this can't happen. I turn around, go back to his office, literally came up and grabbed him by the shirt. And I said, you've got to look at this. You know, I mean, I, I was so intense and he goes, well, if you can get Deepak to agree with this, it's your baby. <laughs> so that was the next step. I had to get Deepak to agree, but I somehow knew that he would. So next day, I, I, I don't, shouldn't need to put all these details in, but anyway, next day, Monday, I walked in first thing, went to his assistant, Margie, gave her a brochure for the Lobert, which had all these beautiful pictures of the hotel and various rooms in the hotel and the view of the ocean. And I said, cause she was gonna pick him up at the airport. And I said, please give this to Deepak when you pick him up and tell him that they have agreed to give us the same, uh, the same deal that, that we were gonna get with the Marriott. So I'm waiting in his office, you know, thinking, <laughs> oh God, you know, what's gonna happen? He comes walking in the door and he's got the brochure in his hand. He looks right at me. He goes, we got to look at, we got to look. What did he say? We got to look into this. This is, you know, this is great. And I knew from that moment that he was, he would be on board. Anyway, there was a lot more to this story, but, but we ended up 
getting the Lauberge. I was able to live there and work there. And we had wonderful programs there. I mean, it was, it was such an exciting time because Deepak was very much in the media and all of, and we had a lot of celebrity guests coming, you know, a lot of well-known people, which, you know, made news and, um, and uh, so it, it, it really, so our, our program was really, you know, exciting interest through, through the various media and people talking about it. So it was a very exciting time to be there. And, um, and, uh, well, you know, and we, we had this other program at Sharp Hospital. We had this program going. And I don't even remember why I started telling you this story, but I guess it was because it was, um, it was one of those things where you're just, um, you, you don't know how things happen, but it's really remarkable that they do because we were there for two years before we learned that the hotel had actually gone into Chapter 11. Uh, it was privately owned. And so, uh, uh, and it was, it was really unfortunate because we, we really had dialed this place in. We had these beautiful rooms. They had done so much for us. They'd created all these treatment rooms for the uh, Ayurvedic treatments, the Panchakarma treatments. We each had offices there. We had a big yoga room. We had a dining room. We had a library. It, it, it was really working. You know, we, we, we got, and, and I just worked all the time. I, I was really I think the reason I even began telling about this was because I was also teaching the yoga classes there while I was overseeing this and teaching uh, various other little courses there, which I loved doing. I don't think I was such a good administrator, but I loved teaching. And um, But anyway, eventually um, that hotel was sold and we had to move elsewhere. So we ended up um, eventually moving to La Jolla uh, to Fay Avenue. Were you there, Corinne? That's when, we when were I Faye came Avenue? on. I was in the that? yeah. I was in the second um, teacher training, primordial sound training that they had. The second one. Yeah, in ninety six mm -hmm. or ninety five, something. Yeah, like that. yeah. It's a beautiful well, space. The, 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 yeah. Well, anyway, it, 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 yeah, beautiful. Anyway, it was um, it was uh, it was quite a time. <laughs> um, so a really wonderful you... time though. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, and th I mean, there's so many of us that, 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 well, the, my era started at, in La Jolla when you, when you just left off that when moved, you moved to Fay Avenue, my era that I came on board started there and met everybody from, from sort of then on. And, um, mm -hmm. and, and so a lot of the people that I know, the other teachers that I know are from sort of that area. So it's fun to hear sort of right before, cause I knew about Lancaster, but I really didn't know about the other place in Del Mar. I'd heard bits and pieces, but this is the first time I'm hearing the story. So thank you for sharing that. That was fun for me anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so, but I want to know when you got into Vedic astrology, because that's such a big part of your life. So when did that start? Well, well thank you for that, asking that, because it really is a big part of my life. It's, it's become my dharma. And um, well, you know, even from an early age, I was, and I tell this sometimes when I'm giving lectures, that I was always curious about when people were born, because just hearing their birth date, I, I somehow had a, felt like I had some inner knowledge of them somehow, don't know how, or more of an intuitive knowledge. But eventually when I learned there was something called astrology, I began to study it. And I actually studied Western astrology for about 20 years. And, um, and then, but at Lancaster, when I was working there, we were visited by a Jyotishi, a Vedic astrologer. And because of my interest in astrology, he agreed to do my Vedic chart. And as I explain, whenever I'm lecturing on the subject, you know, Vedic astrology is distinctly different from Western astrology, um, Western tropical astrology, the Western Astrology uses the tropical zodiac, which is a solar-based or seasonal system. Tropical means movable, and it's based on the relative and changeable position of the sun. Whereas uh, Vedic astrology uses what's called the sidereal zodiac, which refers to the actual observable fixed positions of the constellations as we see them in the sky. It's the same zodiac any astronomer would look at. 
Uh, so there is a distinct difference because there's a difference of 24 degrees between these two, uh, which I, I probably shouldn't get into now. It's a little bit technical, I think, for our conversation. But and, and you know, it, it just trust me, it, there's a real <laughs> difference between the Western chart and the Vedic chart. The, the other big difference is that in the, in the Vedic chart, we don't think of a person as being a sun sign. We're, we're actually more interested in the position of the moon and what is called the sidereal ascendant or the rising sign. That becomes the key or the entry point into the Vedic chart. And the rising sign is, you know, as we're returning with the planet right now, for example, or, or let's say this morning, as we're turning with our planet, the sun appeared to rise. It wasn't rising. We're just turning in relation to the sun. As we turn with the planet, in the same way, different constellations will appear on the eastern, appear to rise on the eastern horizon different times of the day and night. So each of us, when we were born, um, were born at a particular time when a particular degree of one of the 12 constellations was appearing on the eastern horizon from the location where we were born. And that sort of sets up the relationship of all the visible planets at the time of our birth to the event of our birth. And the rising sign really gives clues about our personality, our physical body, the way we present ourselves to the world. So we think of, of ourselves in terms of being a rising sign. Um, so when I had this reading from this Vedic astrologer in Lancaster, my mind was blown. And I, I often say, you know, because I loved astrology, I, it was like an article of clothing I wanted to wear. I felt like this, you know, there was something about this that I, I wanted to, to know, but I, I, the suit just didn't quite fit me. You know, the chart didn't quite fit me, the Western chart. And I, I don't say this to disparage anyone who, are in, who may be interested in Western astrology or practicing Western astrology. Many people get good insight and um, inspiration from Western astrology, but it must be noted that Western astrology is not accurate to the constellations. Any astronomer will tell you that. The tropical zodiac is not accurate to the observable constellation. Doesn't make Western astrology wrong or irrelevant, but it, it needs to be read with that understanding if you're really going to do, you know, proper um, analysis of the chart. So anyway, when this guy did this reading for me in, in Lancaster, I was just so stunned. It was like suddenly the suit fit, and I really liked the way it felt. <laughs> and from that moment, I I never looked back. I I began to read everything I could. I began to talk to anybody that knew anything about Vedic astrology. And this, we're talking 1991 um, or 92 back then. So Vedic astrology really was only beginning at that time to be known about in the West. I mean, among very many people. I mean, the TM organization eventually did uh, start to bring Vedic astrologers over from India and began, and they began doing readings. The um, the ISKCON movement, the the Hare Krishna movement, were very involved in Vedic astrology, and they had a long, number of very well trained people uh, among their devotees who really knew what they were doing, really knew their stuff, and so they were doing it, but still not on not on a large scale. Not many people knew what Vedic astrology was. <laughs> So um, anyway, eventually I had a good teachers in this country and in India. I had um, occasion to meet some very fine teachers in India. Corinne, you must have had some readings in India when you were there. Did you have your chart done or some? I had a naughty reading in India. I had uh, Jyotish astrologers from India readings in the U.S., Got it. Well, uh, just to just to clarify, the Nadi readings were a little different than having your chart read by an astrologer. This was something that's done it's quite extraordinary. Uh, Deepak wrote about this in his book, The Book of Secrets. And when he came back from India, he I he called me in his office and he told me about this experience where it's a longer story than we want to get into, but he had one of these readings and, you know, that you go in and they, they take your thumbprint and they go through a bunch of these, what he called scrolls. They're these, what are called falls, P-H-A-L-S, which means fruit, but it's a 
a little bark piece of bark that has writing on it. And uh, anyway, through a series of process of elimination, they f- when they find your right fall, if they do find it, and you know about this, they, they can tell you all kinds of things about what happened in the past and also what is likely to happen in the future. It's really quite amazing uh, for anybody that hasn't heard of it. It's, and when you say the Nadi, N-A-D-I, it's spelled, or sometimes called a Brigu reader because Brigu was one of the one of the uh, rishis who, from whom this the tradition of Nadi readers came. There are others. There's an Augustia, and I think there may be another one too. But in any case, there's a whole um, enormous collection of these falls that had been handed down for you know thousands of years, really, and had actually been re-translated uh, by scribes like 1,500 years ago. And they've been kept by families after the British... Um, moved out of India, they had confiscated a lot of these things. Well, they wanted to get rid of them. And they, so they sold them to some Indian families anyway. They, so they were kept by these families who would attempt to do these, these um, uh, consultations for people. But anyway, that's a little bit different. It's certainly different from what I do. Um, although the Vedic astrology chart is usually noted in a, in a naughty reading. I don't know if they showed you your chart when you went, they usually will draw it out. Yeah. I'm not and sure. I've had, that. I've had one of, was it a good one? Was your naughty reading a good experience? You know, it, it wasn't quite as uh, spectacular as some people's I've heard about. You know, Deepak, of course, had a, an extraordinary reading. I think Arielle probably, she had a pretty good one. Or they, they knew the names of her parents, and she, she describes that in, in detail. And, um, but what, the one I had, I, I wasn't sure. It took, they took a long time, you know, and there were, um, they would bring out these scrolls and they would read something and you'd say yes or no. And if it wasn't true, they would put it away. So they're trying to get a scroll that has, I think at least 10 items that were true. And then they know how to go to your other scroll. So eventually they did find scrolls for me. I honestly feel that, you know, once they've got, I mean, you know, it is a business for these people in many ways. Some of them are very authentic, but you know, once they got your money, uh, they want to give you, try to give you something for it. So you don't get asked for your money back. So I think he actually got my birth information from me and eventually just went away and calculated my chart and, and gave me some information from my chart, which was still good information. I still feel that um, a lot of what he told me was, was pretty accurate. But I, I wasn't, you know, completely bowled over the way some people were, certainly the way Deepak was. He was, he well, was thrown I, away. And, and Brent, okay, you've known Deepak for a lot of years. What I've come to is that, you know, because I've, I've, I'm sure you have too because you've known him for so long. We both adore Deepak, but we've both been probably in situations with Deepak where something happens and then the story grows and becomes different. And so that's what I came to the conclusion about the naughty reading is that, you know, there might be some Indian embellishments in there because, yeah, everybody who listens to him talk about the naughty reading, they want to go immediately to India and find their naughty, uh, you know, their yeah. their leaf. But, um, yeah, so that's sort of what I came to conclusion, especially because I was married to an Indian for 10 years from, you know, I was married you know. to a guy from Chennai. You know. So, so yeah, I mean, that's part of, and, and us too, like, I'm a storyteller too. I'm a songwriter. You, you also, and you do embellish over the years with things. And so anyways, that's my point of view with the naughty. Right. I, I, yeah, I certainly don't disagree with that. Um, did you go to, to uh, Swami Malai where you had your naughty reading in Swami Malai? Do you know that little place in, in yes. Tamil Nadu? Yes. That's where I went. Yeah. That's exactly because okay. the Chopra yeah. Center recommended that, that I go there. That and I had my foot was broken at the time. Oh my God. Um, but they they did the same thing with me as you're describing. Is and I I felt this like when you had said they asked because they asked they said oh if you're not Indian we have to know your name and your birth date because I'm like well aren't you supposed to tell me my name and my birth date. And they said, oh, no, if you're not Indian, we need your name and your birth date. And then to me, they were figuring out everything through a process of elimination. But there were 
two pieces of information okay. that I tell stories about. One was information about my husband that I would meet in two years, Satya from India, that, that he, he told me. They told me my husband would live on an east-west street. And, um, and then when I met Satya two years later, his first restaurant, who, you know, I ended up marrying him a year later, um, his first restaurant in, in Tiruvannamalai was the East West Cafe. So, oh my gosh. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So there was that. And there was, there was one of, that was like one of the main things, um, that I, that I, oh yeah. And, yeah. So anyway, I had a couple of signs when I met him. So, so yeah, I'm very familiar with, you know, with the whole India thing. Cause I, and I still live in, have a place in Tirvanamalai and I have a orphanage that you know about that Shay Shay has been too many times in Tirvanamalai as well. So I do. Yeah. I, I think that's so wonderful. I love Tirvanamalai. I loved being there. I've been there a number of times and done the circumambulation. Yeah, the production. Yeah, There's Ramana there right there. I've got there him is. all over. He's all over my room, actually. Mm-hmm. I've every every wall that I look at is mm-hmm. he's there. Him and him and Arunachala. They're my. I like dead gurus because um, they don't have egos. Well, you know, we are our own guru, aren't we? we if we re- really learn how to how to connect with you know, what's true in us. And that's what any good guru is going to do. He's going to hold up a mirror. He, she or she is going to hold up a mirror and say, you are that, you know, uh, don't look any further. Um, and, and, and certainly don't give your power away to somebody else. Uh, I mean, there, it's a little tricky. The guru sheesh, uh, tradition in India, um, you know, it's, it, it, there's more t- tradition to it and history to it, the way, you know, people are taught, uh, young people are taught by, uh, gurus, but but I, I really feel that's the truth. Any good guru is going to continue to you know remind you that you are you are in fact a guru. You you not you the obviously the our the personality the idea of a me, but the consciousness which is so present. There's just one consciousness, and it, you know it's expressed in different forms and phenomena like a you, a me, and the trees and the you know everything else, but I think that's the real, um, um, uh, Corinne, I did want to add one important detail, um, to this story that you're, you're so patient in listening to. Um, at one point when we were at the Loberge, uh, I, I believe we were at the Loberge, maybe, maybe by then we, uh, yeah, um, yeah, we were at the Loberge, either there or Fay Avenue, I can't remember, but anyway, at some point Deepak came to me and said, I, 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 this oh I know what it was I got to tell this part first I had gone with him to India Roger and I Ariel and Brian and Deepak's family and Ariel and Brian were traveling over there and they came and joined us in India they were in Israel or somewhere and they came and joined us so Roger and I were there and we were there because Deepak had been invited to the ashram of the Shankaracharya of Jyotirmat uh, to receive his um, blessing, his acknowledgement. And um, so, you know, we were excited to be able to go with him. And this was a big deal. So we went to this ashram and uh, the Shankaracharya was a powerful presence. Uh, And we were all seated there and, you know, he was speaking in, uh, I think it was a Southern dialect. I don't remember what, what he spoke, but Deepak somehow was able to understand him uh, or, or had an interpreter or something. But anyway, so he really spoke for a long time. Shankar Chari had many monks with him and it was a very, you know, kind of exciting time there in, in India. This was the, you know, like the, the, um, the keepers of the Vedic tradition, you know, the, there were four Shankar Acharyas, as you know, and this was the Shankar Acharya of the North. And uh, this, so, you know, we're, we're just really in awe of this whole thing, this very old ashram and all these monks that are chanting in Sanskrit. It's really, it was really an incredible experience. So at some point, you know, that, that all ended and, and Deepak and the Shankaracharya were going to converse together and sort of in a private uh, uh, conversation. So we all kind of dispersed and I happened to wander out into a little courtyard and there was nobody around. And I see there the shrine of Adi Shankara. And 
I just felt because of my, my life, I wasn't sure where my life was going at that point. There was a lot of changes going on. And so I really just sat down and started to pray, <clears throat> pray for just asking for guidance. You know, where should I really go? What's my Dharma now? How can I really best, you know, contribute? Just asking for Dharma, basically. And I remember just sort of letting it go. And I, I started to get up and to walk away. And I looked up and there was the Shankaracharya standing in the balcony, probably 25, 30 feet away from me. I didn't even see him come there. I mean, it was like such a shock because I didn't think anybody was around. And he's kind of peering at me. And in that moment, I was like, I felt completely seen. I, I felt like there was nothing, I, I, there was nothing I could hide about myself. Hmm. That's that that was my my distinct impression of that moment, that that there was nothing to hide about me. And but anyway, and then he just sort of straightened up and then walked away. And I was like, wow, what was that? What just happened? Anyway, it wasn't long after that that Deepak called me into his office. He said, I want you to bring Jyotish into the Chopra Center. And I'm like, wow, what? I said, Deepak, I need three more lifetimes of study. This is a huge subject. You know, to, I'm thinking in my mind to represent you and, and the Chopra Center doing this. He pointed his finger at me. He said, you've been preparing for this for a long time. This is your dharma. That's the truth. I was like, okay. I mean, I, I, what was I going to do? I, I was, you know, and of course, in my heart was I'm really excited to be able to do this, but I'm thinking, whoa, how am I, how am I going to make this happen? And anyway, that was a longer story than I probably ought to get into now, but about how that did develop. But eventually, uh, it became what I called the Vedic Counseling Program, and I became the the director of that. And that was over 20 years ago, and I've been doing that ever since. Um. I studied with a very fine teacher for 13 years during that time. And uh, because I really felt like I needed to really, you know, strengthen my practice. So I, I felt like being, being in that position to represent the Chopra Center and doing that, that work. My background is in psychology. I have a master's in psychology and I'd done a lot of counseling with people and I'd been trained in Ayurveda. I'd been trained in meditation. I've been trained as a yoga teacher. So all those elements I could bring in to the counseling process. But the chart, the Vedic astrology chart, became sort of the this, this central feature of that counseling process. And, and it continues to this day to be that uh, resource that I, when I'm working with people, when I'm counseling people, uh, there's so much that I, I get from the chart. It's just so extraordinary. I love doing this every day. I get to do this and it really is my Dharma. And as Deepak said, you know, you've been preparing for this for a long time. I feel this was a, again, picking up the threads of a past life because this, this has come so um, instantly to me in many ways. And it's been, it's been so gratifying to share this with people. I feel it's such an intimate experience to sit. And, and I love giving lectures to groups, but I, I really like sitting with or, or being on Zoom like we are with um, with one person at a time. I'm sorry, the sun's coming in here pretty strong. With one person at a time. And uh, can you see me? Yeah, all right? that's all better. Right? That's better. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, it's been a, it's been the it's been, you know, one of the great gifts of my life. I mean, working with Deepak has been, you know, such an incredible blessing. I know so many people that have worked with him will agree and and yet um him pointing his finger at me and telling me to do this and i mean that was that was truly a, a great 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 blessing and it, and it uh, i'm always grateful to him and i'm grateful to marishi too for you know all the uh the vedic knowledge that he brought and that that he was the one that sort of catalyzed deepak and kind of awakened Hit the thread of his past lives, you know, into doing what he's been doing all these years. So, uh, it's, it's interesting. Anyway. The way you described, uh, you described astrology as more of a counseling tool uh, or a, uh, not, not a therapy tool, but more of a more, much more intimate um, 
conversation with somebody regarding their past, present, and, and kind of you know potential future, you, you do look at it that way because I think there's a misconception about astrology and and especially in the West, um, you know, oh what's what's your zodiac sign and you know compatible mates and y- like you said you can you can get some fun little bits of information, but you look at this as a a very very uh, deep lens into somebody's life as it sounds. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a window into a person's karma. And I take it very seriously because it is, as I said, it's a very intimate uh, inquiry into, you know, another person's life. So, you know, I feel one of the real, the real therapeutic benefit of using Vedic astrology in a session with people is that they feel seen, mm. you know? I mean, when you start telling them things about, I mean, most of the people I, I meet on Zoom, I've never met before. I don't know anything about them except their birth data. And if I get accurate birth information, I can start to tell them, not that I'm so uh, clairvoyant. I tell people I'm not clairvoyant or omniscient, you know, any more than anybody else, but I've had good teachers. And, and if you follow the formulas, you're going to get really good information about a, a person and, you know, it's quite, it's quite extensive what a chart can do, including these planetary periods that I alluded to earlier, like the Jupiter period. We, each of us right now, each, each of us is going through a, um, a, a very unique planetary period. And we all go through a sequence from the time we're born until the time we leave the body. That's one of the reasons my whole life has changed. I just moved into a whole new major period beginning of this year. Uh, and moved after for after 20 years of living in Marin County. I moved down here to to Santa Santa Barbara County, um, and a lot more has shifted too. But 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 knowing these planetary periods, you can kind of get some insight into what people are going through. And you also look at the transits of you know planets, ma- mainly the big planets Saturn and Jupiter, and you'll get really good information about what people are going through. So I think to answer your question, Sean, I think it is a counseling tool. People feel, they feel, I, I see it all the time. They, I see them relax because they, they know that even though I, I may be able to tell them or see things about them, you know, that they don't know how I know or how I can see, they feel safe. Mm. And to me, that's the real therapeutic benefit of, of these sessions is that people feel that they can relax and they can, they don't have to be a personality, a song and dance. They don't have to be a, an ego. They don't have to hold up some idea about who they are. It's because it is intimate. They, they, they trust me. I think that's really the key. And, and I think that's what I really hope to ex- experience and accomplish with doing this is that people, there's a trust factor. And, and I think that's true in any therapeutic thing too. They eventually, hopefully there's a, there's a relationship. There's a, there's an intimacy that develops with the, 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 the therapist. So um, I often say to people, I don't, I'm not interested in telling you my, telling you your fate. I, I would want somebody to do that to me. You, you know, even though, we, you know, the, the naughty reader you, you talked about earlier, they tell you, well, this will happen. Da, 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 da. You know, in a way, I don't want anybody to tell me my fate. What, what I'm interested in is how can I help people yeah. become more conscious so that they have more free will? Because we do have choice. There is some, you know, there in, we look at the Vedic chart and there are, you know, several different types, types of karma that are reflected in a Vedic chart. There's more flexible karma that can be changed pretty easily. There's firm karma that is, you know, a little harder to, to change, you know, old habits that we came in with, old some scars that, you know, we kind of got blinders on for. And then they talk about there's more fixed karma that is probably not going to change so much in, in, in one lifetime unless you're enlightened, you know. So um, I feel like I, I don't want to focus on somebody's fate. To, to me, that, that doesn't really do them a, any service. I want to encourage people by saying, you know, you have a choice to become more conscious. And I try to give them the tools or, or at least encourage them in the tools that we know are available through the, the yoga tradition. You know, certainly the, the most important being meditation. I, I often feel like 
in my work, I'm just trying to kind of trick, I'm joking, but I, I feel like I'm kind of trying to trick people into meditating. You know, if you'll only meditate, you can change, you can transform your karma. You can transmute your karma. You can get, you can, you know, shed these old habits that you just keep repeating. You know, you, you can become more conscious and, and therefore have more free will and make a better life for yourself. To me, that's really something I can do. You know, there, there are times you'll be able to pretty much pinpoint something like, a, like with a weather report and say, you know, this is very likely to happen and here's the kinds of things you can do so it's not going to be um, a problem. You know, you could mitigate this if you'll, you know, do these various things. In India, they have, as you know, Corinne, they have all these upayas, these remedial measures that are done. And some of them are things like, you know, performing charitable actions, um, certainly, I mean, there are all kinds of very esoteric uh, upayas, but, you know, some of the main ones are using certain mantras, doing a particular sadhana, a particular uh, spiritual practice that's maybe recommended or prescribed by a pundit. You'll see people wearing gemstones all over India, too, because gemstone therapy has, is, uh, you know, been done there for long time. Um, I'm not so eager to recommend gemstones to Westerners unless they really ask about it or unless I feel like they're open to it and this would really make a difference for them because it, it really can, as you probably know, gemstones are powerful, potent um, uh, sort of uh, conductors. And if they're initiated in the right way, you know, they can have a, a powerful influence, you know, positive influence. So, um, but, but I think the main thing is to get people to meditate. You know, if they could just do that, make it a part of their daily routine. And of course, that's been our message through the Chopra organization for all these years. All Deepak's books, all his courses, all his talks, everything he does, it's all geared toward getting people to sit down, you know, first thing in the morning before breakfast, coffee, tea, put the gear shift into neutral, just let everything settle down into the silence of our being. And then again, ideally late afternoon um, to do it again. So, um, and, and people, you know, that's the very satisfying thing about when I'm doing these sessions with people, when they really get it and they go, I'm going to do that. I'm going to meditate. And I, and I hear from people later on saying, you know, Hey, thank you for the encouragement. You know, I've been doing it every day and I'm really starting to feel the benefits. Um, I'm, I'm really noticing, you know, how much I look forward to meditating every day. And, uh, because in my, it's, it, it was the very thing that, that really changed my, my life when I really began to meditate every day and regularly and really began to feel the benefits and still do. It's the most important time I spend every day is, is sitting with my eyes closed. You know, it's not about all the stuff we do. I mean, yeah, I mean, we have a lot more energy for creativity and, and a vigorous action when we've had deep deep rest. So meditation does give us deep rest. I don't want to turn this into a lecture on meditation, but <laughs> I know you know what I'm talking about. Boy, the sun is really blasting in here. That's okay. And I do love the sun. That's why uh, one of the reasons I really love it here. You're, 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 Go ahead. you're lit up, Brent. You're enlightened, which leads <laughs> me to the question that I wanted to ask you. Uh -huh. um, what is enlightenment to you? What's your definition yeah. of enlightenment? Oh, it's a good question, isn't it? Um, well, I think we can talk about, you know, the process of enlightenment. I, you know, I feel that we all have moments uh, of realization, hopefully, as we do our spiritual practice. We have moments of, of sort of knowing who we are as consciousness in this moment, this very moment knowing that that we're not really this body, you know, we're, we're sort of moving this body around. It looks pretty much like it did yesterday when we get up this morning, look in the mirror, but we know that this body isn't really who or what we are. As Deepak points out, it's an experience that we have. It's not a noun, it's a verb. And we're not the roles we play. We're not the personality that we've made up, the song and dance that we've developed in order to feel safe in the world and to, get along with people and hopefully avoid uh, 
uh, you know, negative experiences. We're not the, the relationships that we had. And I think enlightenment is sort of coming to a place of realizing that who and what we really are is that in which all of this is taking place in any moment, even now. And so I think it's a, it's a little bit of a shift from the, the local identification with the character to a sense of context of, of, of there being something bigger in which all of this, this um, story of the me is taking place, all this experience uh, uh, that we have in, in life. I also feel that enlightenment and in the moments that I think I've had some clear experiences of that, that everything is as it is. It is in this moment as it is. And, and we, we sort of get, get out of the way with our filter of, of, of um, the judgment about what is. There's not even a thought of what is. There's just a direct experience of what is, an innocent experience of what is. And that's why I think that that's a very good intention for all of us to have, to re remember at times or, or to check, are we allowing everything to be as it is? Are we in resistance in some way to what is? Are we, because in, in resistance, we're, we're creating stress for ourselves. We're creating the duality. So I think enlightenment is, you know, being in alignment with the one consciousness however that may happen to us. And it happens through some to some people, I think through spiritual practice and some people it just kind of dawns on them. I, I know that some people have, um, and there are different stages of enlightenment I've, I'm, I've come to, to, to realize or come to, to, to believe because I haven't had some of these exalted states of enlightenment where, where um you know, like Sri Ramakrishna was just in, in a state of complete ecstasy, uh, you know, completely oblivious of the body and everything. He was completely immersed in the divine. So I think there are different levels of that uh, experience of, of enlightenment. And I think as gradually as we shed our karma, little bit by little bit, we, we are available to more of those kinds of experiences of higher consciousness. Um, I, I don't know that there's one experience of enlightenment, though. I, I, I don't think there is. I think it's a process for everybody. It's kind of a, a you know, a letting go of, of um, you know, this contracted fear-based ego state, which is just a, you know, a bundle of self-defense patterns that we've accumulated in order to feel safe in the world as we gradually, and that's why meditation is so important. It helps us just to gradually let go of the fear, let go of the stress, let go of the defenses and just come to that place of being, that pure silence of being. And that's why I love, um, you know, being on retreat or, you know, like I facilitate co-facilitate this retreat we do every year with Deepak called silent awakening, which is, um, it's a, um, a week long silent retreat. And, um, we did it for the last seven years, Amanda Rignalda and I, uh, facilitated this at, uh, at, uh, um, Silomar in Monterey and it's been wonderful. So this year we're moving, we're going to have it looks like hopefully in September, uh, at, um, the Tanaya Lodge in Yosemite, I think it's been sold out for a year, um, but we love doing this retreat and people have just tremendous experiences of just coming to being, you know, uh, because as you know, from being in Turbo Online and being on retreat yourself and, you know, when you're in, a, in that place where you, you don't have to be a personality, you don't have to be a, a, a role, you know, you can just relax and let go of all that stuff. And being in a natural environment where you're nourished and nurtured by the, the um, you know, the, the environment, something, ha a, a natural shift takes place. And we remember who we are. We remember that consciousness, which is who and what we truly are. And that's just, you know, that's why we're here. That's why we're here. Why well, we are here. 
Yeah, I I'm thank you for answering that because I I mean you put it beautifully. I mean you've been talking about this stuff for many years, so I just had a feeling there'd be some nuggets in there and there absolutely was. Is beautiful. And it is what was fun for me too is, you know, it, I'm getting a similar uh, experience with you that we had with Roger because, you know, Roger was the one that taught me how to be a meditation teacher. And so I didn't realize, you know, how many Rogerisms there was within me. And now there's some Brentisms in too, which is probably the Maharishi influence because I started off in TM as well. We all have, you know, and then also I too that, that, that Shankracharya uh, initiation, you know, that I, were you there in India, this, I think it was the second or third time the how to know God trip. And we were all, he had the Shankaracharya of North India come in and do a puja. And we were all initiated into that, all that 500 of us. Yes, I knew. Yeah. Exactly. And so mm -hmm. I've, it's been interesting to me how that's mm -hmm. come back into my life. Like I've been listening to a lot of Rupert Spira lately and he's totally into the Shankaracharya of North India, the uh, sh um, Tantric Shaivism um, uh, direct path is what he talks about. And so it, it's interesting how I, I d didn't do it consciously, but it's all just been happening. So um, so thank you for, for sharing. I mean, all of, I mean, we could talk for a couple more hours easily, right, Sean? Oh, yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. We We're coming to California. <laughs> yeah, and I want to get a reading. I haven't been drawn well, you, to do. You, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to say you were very gracious to hold space for me to to talk uh, all, all this and and to um, allow allow me to share. I, I'm grateful to both of you. It's it's a really nice environment that you create here for people, and it is an important conversation, you know, to inquire deeply into you know, not just who we are, but, you know, our, our spiritual path. And I love Rupert Spira. I, I listen to him all the time. He's, he's really, I'm glad to know, you know, who he is. And he's been to a number of Chopra events and spoken there. And yeah. But um, yeah, I'd love to do your chart sometime. Just let me know when you want to do it. Yeah. I, I was to say, I actually have not, I swore you off. Too. And well, if you want to do it, if you let me know, we'll do it on Zoom. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be great. Go I'd ahead. love for him to do it. Cause he's, you've never done any, well, you did a reading with Satya. I did a reading with Satya. Um, man, it's that was a long time ago. <laughs> and, you know, he's a friend of mine. We, we got pretty deep. I got, that might've been nine or 10 years ago. So I, I, I've come a long way since that reading. So I'd be curious to see, you know, what's, uh, what's in yeah, there. And I'm excited to share the link, um, Brent. I'll put all in the in the episode notes, both on YouTube and the podcast. I'll put all the links to your website and everything, so that people can find you. Because I'm sure many of our people, when they listen to this, they will want to do um, get an appointment with you. So um, thanks for sharing your passion <coughs> about it. Thanks, Corinne. Are you still playing any music? Yeah, I play uh, for my students at the end of yoga. I usually play uh, New Year's Eve. I, I usually play New Year's Eve. I do a kirtan New Year's Eve. Um, and I, it, when I teach retreats, I do a music evening. So it's not as, you know, like I'm not, of course, none of us are traveling around playing music right now. But, um, you know, I definitely have more of a passion for sharing well, I guess all of it, but I'm the same as you. Meditation, that's been my uh, thing for many years. That's what I love to share with people. And I do I do life coaching with people too, but it's a requirement for people when they do when they work with me that I teach them to meditate and they meditate every day or else I don't work with them. <laughs> so. That's a good, good, way to, good, good, good way to get people to do it. What about you, Sean? Do you play music? Anymore? Um, Are you I, these days? I don't play anymore. Uh, I do uh, music production, so uh, recording and engineering. I'm, I built a studio up in here in Wisconsin. Actually, you know, to the, the conversation we had before this um, regarding family and, you know, spending time, I moved from Nashville to Wisconsin to be closer with family. I got, I got three kids married, and we moved back home to be closer to my parents and her parents. And um, so we've, we've had 
a lot more time. Um, and actually, you know, I, I built a few houses, including our house with my 93 year old grandfather. He's 93 now. And so I have had that time. It's been, um, it's been a struggle at times to, to be back with family, but, uh, but nonetheless, you know, rich for, you know, having the experiences of coming together and, and sharing life and having the kids, you know, have the grandparents. So yeah, I, you know, I take, I take that, that, uh, recommendation seriously. And Good for you. Good and for you, also man. his, your, and yeah, in your studio too. I mean, he's, he's actually zooming in right now from his recording studio. He's got his, you can't see it right now, but he's got his big, big console right yeah. where his computer is. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. I guess I guess we should wrap it yeah. up, boys, even though. Um, so, Brent, I hope you'll agree to come on and talk to us again because I love your stories. Thanks, Corinne. It was a pleasure. I'd be happy to anytime. Let me know. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks, thanks to both of you. Oh, thanks. Yeah, you're doing you're doing good work. Oh, thanks. It was a pleasure. Good, to good work. Yeah. And, uh, I, I really I really enjoyed uh, uh, everything you had to say, and uh, I you know I can't wait to hear more. So I'll be we'll be we'll be in touch very shortly. Sounds good. All right. Well, enjoy yourselves. And we are in the say more section with Brent Backfar. That was an amazing opportunity to. For once, maybe in my uh, podcast career, uh, sit and just listen and really take all that uh, that in. I mean, he had so many stories from back with Deepak and how all that transition happened. And um, like I said in the in the intro, there were some technical issues. Like I had to run. Uh, we didn't mention this in the podcast, but uh, it started to pour. Uh, we had a big thunderstorm roll in, and I had some windows open, so I had to jet, and then I lost power. So that was why I left all of a sudden, and um, I was telling you in between the reason we need the rain. I'm excited about it because we just popped, or we just planted some popcorn, if anybody cares to know. So, and, uh, yeah, so I've got some seeds. I'm going to plant some corn seeds soon because I, 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 I grew corn one time. Um, cause Colleen always says we don't have enough room, but I think I've got enough room now. And you're also supposed to plant a minimum of two rows or something. Cause the cross pollination or something yeah. like that. Anyways. So I didn't know that like, is it a different kind of seed for popping corn? Yes, they are. There are actually a variety of pop popping corns. We planted three different varieties of popcorn. We actually eat a lot of popcorn. That's like our family thing is we do movie nights and, um, but yes, yeah, so we planted this white. It's a Japanese white pop popcorn kernel, uh, very small. Um, and then we planted a yellow. And then there's this one that's it's like a multicolored corn cob. Yeah. And it's yeah. but it pops it pops white. So yeah, you have there. It's very different, and you don't want to plant it with sweet corn or field corn because the cross pollinating from the, the field corn can mess with the popcorn. So. Yes. Wow. Wow. So, 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 so do you know, have you grown this before? Do you know how to process it? Like what the heck do you do once, once it's a cob? Like what do you do? Well, then, you, then you dry it. And actually we have a, uh, my in-laws have a, it's a shucker. So you just put the dry corn cob into the shucker and then it's like this old wheel that spins and then it, it just takes all the kernels off the corn and then you have the popcorn kernels. So how do you dry it? Uh, I believe it dries on stock. If it doesn't dry on stock, then you got to hang dry it. Okay, because usually a normal cob would go moldy. Correct. So it would dry to a certain percentage in the field, and then you'd pick it. And then, then like field corn, they put it in a drying bin, and they blow hot air through it to dry it. But we'll have to just hang dry it to, you know, to a certain degree. Uh, okay, exciting. Yeah. I, I, well, it is exciting. It's cool when you. I mean, it takes a lot of effort to grow food. We go, we, we go into stores and we buy things and we yeah. cook them, and you know we don't even connect to all the care it takes that the earth puts in, that the human puts in, that plants it, the watering, the sun. I mean, it's just it, it, we just eat the food, and there's no connection to the food. No wonder people have digestion issues. Right. And that's kind of, that's been one of our mechanisms of inspiration in having the farm at, um, you know, Meg grew up on a, a farm, so a dairy farm. Uh, but one of the biggest things was like, well, we eat this meat, we eat these vegetables, we have the land now. How do we get as close to that as possible? And we we're definitely not at the point where we can facilitate all of that. But one of the biggest things, especially with, you know, with meat um, is, 
how responsibly can you raise it? How well can you make its life? Um, you know, we, we're raising hogs this year and, you know, they're outside. They get to be in the dirt and they, you know, they, they graze um, along with substitute food. So it's like, but you're with them all the time and you develop this intimate respect for them. And so when it comes time to actually having the meal, there's there's the full energy of the six months time that it took to raise them. You know, the whole process of breaking them down and, you know, packaging and then saving them and knowing how it's, you know, for your family. It's it's a deep process, but then also the risk. I mean, you put, you know, you put crops in and then if it the weather doesn't work out or it floods out or whatever, you can lose it. And that's the that's the reality of a lot of farmers, you know, deal with all the time. And so we're really kind of getting as close to that as possible. As you know, you know, with Ivy House, you have a big garden and, um, you know, I'm sure you've lost things or things haven't worked out. It's, it's a, it's a deep process. It is. I did lose my corn that I've grew corn one time only. I grew like eight stalks only. And, um, but, and, and they, and they, and I got two cobs or three cobs off the eight stalks, and then a, and then a mold got them, and they were dead two days later, all of them. But they were the best three cobs of corn I've ever eaten in my life. So that's why I'm inspired to do it again. That was two years ago, and um, yeah, I'm inspired to do it again. It's a it's a process, but it's a beautiful process, and it's a it's such a learning. It, you know, met many metaphors for life. For yeah. Sure. Um, so okay, so let's back to Brent. I loved where he started. Um, he started in childhood, as many spiritual seeking type people uh, have these sort of awakenings, these ahas in childhood, and then their life just sort of seems to take them uh, in certain directions. You know, for him, it was this nowhere land, which I thought was awesome. (laughs) Like, I wonder if he saw Peter Pan. He's only five, so I'm sure he hadn't seen Peter Pan. It was just... Cause that's, you know, cause never, never land, you yeah. know, but nowhere land. I just, I love that. And, um, and then, and then he found yoga. Um, and then, and then eventually the, the astrology he got into, you know, so that was, and, and I know Brent from the Chopra center from many years ago and he was the Jyotish, which is also an, another name for Vedic astrologer at the Chopra center. And, he he was sort of on his way out a little bit as I was on my way in, and so I he was he was kind of a, more of a consultant rather than teaching there full time, okay. and then of course I then ended up working there full time when Roger was there, but Brent was gone, and that's how the Chopra Center has been like this amoeba, yeah. that's changed with all these different people coming and going, like the people that are there now. Like Roger even left for a while and then he's back now. And the and the rest of them are people that I don't even know anymore. And now the Chopra Center isn't even a place. Now it's just like, as Roger explained, it's all 100% online now. Yeah. So it's like, it's, you know, yeah, like, I, I, that's kind of my favorite thing these days. Life is kind of like an amoeba and it's ever, it's ever changing. And it, the more we can be fluid with it, you know, just like in a day, like when you have your daytime planner plan, you think you have your planner planned out, right? Like what you're going to do in a day. But even that changes, even if you have scheduling, even that changes. And that's how life is in general. It's like every day is different. Every moment is different. And if we can just show up and be open to that rather than have preconceived notions of, okay, I've got this plan and I have to stick to it, just kind of flow with however the day goes. And then eventually then you flow how the week and then the month and and then you're much more flowy and floaty than being like rigid and like unhappy. <laughs> well, yeah, man. And I, I, I thought it well personally that that story of you know the early life of you know Deepak Chopra and the Chopra Center kind of not even being a thing necessarily yet, but then you know growing into a thing. It it really was well. It was inspiring because you know as you know I was part of a you know ten year. Um, organization that that had there was a lot of similarities in you know the tumultuous beginning or the the very unknown beginning and the aspirations and then it you know it growing and changing but but I I think what was most valuable out of that was was the the rigidity of something like a, a spiritual organization uh like you guys talked about the TM where they were they had become rigid in in some of their, it, I guess, in the structure of what they were allowed, 
lowing into the teaching. And here's this here's this thing that had to become its own thing. <laughs> and that was Deepak and his, I guess, his message or his books or, you know, kind of his path. It was just, it was divined to be something outside of that. And and it, it may it was it was it was making me think about, you know, when you have new prospects, right? You set your sights on, okay, I got this inspiration. I'm going to go that way. And then these pieces come into, into play, and all of a sudden you're like, these are the pieces. And you get attachment, expectations, and you just line it all up, and this is going to be it. And it's got to line it, and you kind of create this vision for it. And then almost inevitably, probably inevitably, they don't necessarily maintain that way through the whole process and things change and evolve or this piece drops off and then you feel this loss it's like oh man that piece was it that was going to be it and and the whole time you're you're missing out on the opportunity to allow this thing to grow and shed and unfold in such a natural way that is available in all of those scenarios and it's kind of funny because you know, I'm sure in the moment it seems very stressful and the pressure of it all changing and, de- and developing could be overwhelming. I know, I know from my experience that when I look back on everything, knowing, knowing the intimate relationship I have with access to the present moment, access to awareness, and I, I just kind of look back at this trail of something that I couldn't have possibly <laughs> articulated or put into play at the time of its inception. And and I know that I struggled the most when I when I was unable to let go of something that needed to change within that process. And that kind of resonated very deeply with me when he was telling that story about it all. Yeah, I mean, I uh, my thing is I always say, how many miracles does it take or synchronicities or looking hindsight does it take for you to trust the moment? Because we always, in hindsight, we look back. That's why the word hindsight's twenty twenty because you look back and you see how divinely orchestrated and perfect it all worked out. And how many, how many times do we see that in our lives until we trust? Because that's what I work with with people every day is them not trusting the flow and trusting the process and trusting the present moment. They're like fighting it and they want to know. And I'm like, do you really want to know? Like, <laughs> you know, even the, the Vedic astrology, that was so beautiful how you asked, you know, you caught that and what Brent was describing that it was more of, of a, um, how did you describe it again? And he said that like a... De- it was a more of an intimate relationship and a yeah. therapy. In a counseling session, yeah, yeah, more more than it was a, a predictive, fortune. more predictive. Yeah, yeah I, I actually, there's another mutual friend of ours that does, and he doesn't do the Vedic astrology because everybody wants to know, you know, when am I going to find love? When am I going to get rich? When am I going to change my career? And and that's not what it's for. Like in India, all the fam, the, if you know, the Indian families have, they have a priest. Um, and they have an astrologer and the priest, you know, the astrologer will tell them, um, sort of guide them, uh, you know, sort of when is a good sort of time to be thinking about having children, not the exact date or whatever, but sort of periods in your life to sort of guide you and counsel you, like you guys were talking about, rather than be predictive and you should say that. And as Brent made that distinction, distinction, you know, he wouldn't want to be told, his fortune told, basically. Um, and that people think that they want that. But when people say that to me, I'm like, well, they go to psychics and stuff, right? And you can use that, those things, whatever tarot cards, reading, whatever you're into, as guidance rather than predictive. Yeah. Yeah. And that was a very, a very strong but subtle distinction that he made regarding that, because what, what hit my, what hit my mind when he said, I don't, I wouldn't want somebody to tell me my fortune was that that fortune then becomes something you atta- you can attach to. Oh, yeah. If you don't know how – well, if you don't know how or if you don't have the counseling to, to navigate some of those aspects, like you said, with, okay, you don't – maybe it would be a better time for you to start having children when you're 25 instead of 22 – that's a very general way of putting it. But if you say 
you have to start having children by 25 or you're never going to have kids. Well, what do you think is going to be in the back of your mind the whole time you're trying to have kids? And then you're going to be stressed and attached and it becomes a burden to know mm-hmm. – to know the, the the future, you know, as as the chart tells you, and so that's, I, I think that's that's a very well. That's becoming a common th- theme, and I think these conversations is that elements of the spiritual process, elements of creating a process f- for mindfulness, can be something you attach yourself to, <laughs> can be something that you have expectations with, and. It's the practice of having a mindfulness practice is great, but also understanding that mindfulness is the key there, not not the rigidity of the practice. Though the rigidity of the practice and having that commitment is a great way to maintain mindfulness. It's somewhat of a paradox, I guess, was I'm saying that, but maybe I didn't come out right. But it's, you know, we get attached to the ideas of mindfulness instead of being in mindfulness. Maybe that's the right way to put it. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, there's so, that's why I like the question I asked him about what is enlightenment, because I think, you know, first of all, words, words fail because we, we may have different meanings to different words and depending on your past is how, you know, and that's why I always say it's like, I know what's coming out of my mouth isn't going to reach anybody (laughs) the way I actually mean it. Yes. Because, you know, that's the filter we have. And so these words, mindfulness and astrology and, and enlightenment and even sp- the word spirituality is going to mean something different. And if your buttons were pushed and, you know, like like I found out when we were interviewing somebody a few weeks ago and they mentioned a guru's name that I don't like, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah. Well, and, and it's be- it, it showcases the slippery slope of not staying in mindfulness, you know, not not being in the present moment and the and having that relationship. And I love the way like I know that what I say is not going to come out the way I feel it. And and I think you know, we mentioned Rupert Spear in the podcast. We've been mentioning him name a lot his name a lot because he's just has this clarity and this this reflection of consciousness, you know, in his words and he he tends to put it well, ultimately, nothing that has been said today is absolutely true because it's been said through the filter of words. It, We're trying it, to talk about something that which can't be talked about. Yeah, yeah, and he he's as clear as he is, and as my, when he's when he answers a question like "what it, what is enlightenment to you?" and he says the words, you're like, "Holy shit." That is as close as you get, can get to describing it, but he still acknowledges that there's there's a limit a limitation to the way it's been said because the experience of it is so far beyond, you know, and and so much greater than that. But that's what we have to work with, and that's what we have to deal with. And he's so he's also very patient, and he also um, he's very. Um, What's the word? It's hard to describe, but he's very patient and he's very in the moment and present with people. And he doesn't give these one-off answers to people when he knows that the one-off answer isn't necessarily what they need in the moment. Um, and I think that's a very important thing is like you you got to be very detached to, to do what he does, which is go into the wilderness with people and, and find them in their lost state. And then I think we talked about this and then help them find their way back by listening to them, not by giving them a bunch of things to do, not by giving them a bunch of, um, you know, riddles or rhymes or, or these long form answers that they're not going to understand expecting that that's going to bring them out of their lostness. It's, it's, you know, there's a, there's a listening element, there's a being element, and then there's, there's a stillness element that he has within him that is truly remarkable. Yeah. Yeah. I've been listening to him a couple hours a day for weeks now. It's, it's, 
permeating. It's awesome. Okay, so I did want to clarify when Brent was talking, uh, we, we'd already gotten to an hour and a half, and so I, I didn't, uh, I thought we could talk about it in the same more section, but I forget the word that he said, but um, to clarify for people, he was saying in India, when they do a reading, they give you these, he had a word that started with a P, but it's basically a remedy. And you know, and what he was talking about is your karma is what he was talking about is your, your karma. So, so meditation helps your karma. So basically in, in layman's terms, what that means is like, say you're meant to experience in this lifetime, um, being in a car accident and breaking a couple of legs. That's just like, maybe when you're 30 in your chart, for whatever reason, it's, this is what's meant to happen. Well, if you, if you know that there's a period that's coming up that is not so great and there might be some problems with the physical body is really what a good astrologer would say, then you can, what's, do, if you do these longer meditations or you've had a meditation practice for 20 years, then maybe what will happen when you come up to that period is you'll sprain your ankle when you step off the sidewalk. Gotcha. And so- Meditation does that, and but the remedies that they give in India, what he was talking about, the gemstones, is, okay, so you're coming up to a certain period of your life where um, you're going to have more illness in your life. It's, and so if you don't do any remedies and you don't meditate, then maybe you're in bed for a couple of months. But if you are meditating and or you get a gem, they say, oh, you should wear like a red gem or a citrine or whatever. And you, you have to wear it close to your skin. So when they make jewels in India, the the, the gemstones are touching your skin or the gotcha. necklace or whatever. And then that affects that energy of clears and it, and it, it, so then you will get a cold for a week or whatever. Right. Yeah. So it's kind of hard to explain and some people might not believe this or whatever, but that's what he was talking about. The remedies. There's some other remedies. He, you know, like feeding hung, the hungry, like they say, go out and, and, and feed 10 people in the street or a hundred people or, ha- you know, have an orphanage or whatever. The, these are all things that help to remedy things that difficult periods that might be coming up in your life. So that's what he was kind of talking about that. I, I think he, some, sometimes, you know, he assumes everybody will know about. And I was like, yeah, there's some people that might not know about this stuff. <laughs> well, and that, that, I mean, that, that's also showcased in his expression when he started talking about when he, when he was asked by Deepak to be the, um, oh boy, I lost it. The, the Chopra Center Jyotish. The Jyotish. Um, his excitement, yes, but his also like, I'm not even remotely prepared for this. I haven't done enough studying. And and then, you know, Deepak saying, you have studied for this period of time and you're, you are ready for you. This is your dharma. And it, it, it shows how much respect for the depth of learning there is in, in astrology, in, in Vedic astrology, because, um, I don't know anything. <laughs> like I basically know nothing about it. And, um, and that's, what's fascinating about it is, is when you come across somebody who is that devout in the, in the practice, but also that devout in the, the regiment of learning more about this, but then in the respect that they have for this process, um, you know, it, I'm sure with his depth of wisdom and understanding of it, it would it's hard to talk about it on such a base level. And if you have any, you know, questions or, you know, re- start researching it, it's, it's a deep, deep well. And, and again, I'm glad that he mentioned that it has almost nothing to do with, you know, tropical, um, astrology, because that was something that I didn't know. You know, you say, well, you go to your chart read, you know, chart read. And it's like, oh, they're going to tell me my future. That's what we do is we kind of, we kind of sum things up in a very, you know, minimal way. And th- that is not at all what this is about. And, um, and I think there are very powerful tools in having your chart read, being able to discuss some of your past karma, your potential future karma. I, the way he approaches it and as like a counselor and, you know, having, wanting to create a more intimate relationship with the person because it feels like the way he talks about it he's going to see you anyways. So it, it, it's a, if he can create that space of um, allowing that person to be seen. So when he is looking at their chart, he is like looking at them in a much deeper way in a, in a, you know, life span kind of a way. Um, I, I, that it was very moving, but yes, I'm sure, I'm sure it is very 
easy for him to say things that he just are like, doesn't everybody know that? It's like, well, no, that's, you know, a lot of gaps in, in our understanding in this, in this world for sure. And, and even what, the word karma, you know, there might yeah. be a lot of people that have misconception of what karma and there's certainly sure. is. And Dharma, he mentioned the word Dharma. It's my Dharma. And that's it. Minu and I, my Indian friend, we had a conversation about that the other day. What is Dharma? So uh, karma, I like to explain, and this is actually Deepak's explanation, is you eat the you eat ice cream. It's got to be Jenny's ice cream because that's the best <laughs> ice cream on the planet. Oh, that's and an attachment. They just came. I can do without ice cream. I go months <laughs> without any ice cream. No, having to have Jenny's ice cream. Oh, that's the karma. Exactly. That's what karma is. You eat Jenny's ice It's a perfect example. Thank you. See, I eat the Jenny's ice cream. I love the Jenny's ice cream. And then I want it again. And that's the cycle of karma. You do yeah. something, you like it, you get attached to it, you want it again. And that creates decisions that make, you know, then you, then you, you know, or you are addicted to love, which I was for many years. And so the love ends in your heart, but, but you're addicted again, you find you're addicted to the unhealthy relationships and you go after the bad boy again. And <laughs> that's a karmic cycle. Um, and so that's really what karma is, is, is a, a, a cycle of, of unawareness, really. And as we be, be meditate more, become more, uh, more aware, become more mindful. And again, the definition of mindfulness is being consciously aware in the moment. So it's not just enough to be present, although it, it is it, when you're fully present, you are consciously aware that you're present. But like, I, I think about it, like when I used to work at the Chopra Center years ago, I loved what I did and I'd sit there on the phones and I'd be, I started off there as the, um, in the sales department. That's where I first started because I loved all the seminars and I knew about all the seminars. So I'd be on the phone talking and I was, I'd be in the moment all day talking to these people, but I wasn't consciously aware that I was in the moment. You know what I'm saying? Yes. And then when I would, re you know, yeah. So it's, it's, it seems like Adi Ashanti has explained it before. It seems like a, like you're trying too hard, but it's something that starts to happen naturally, uh, the more you meditate and the more you do these things, um, that aware that you're aware has, starts to happen. Yes. Yeah. And that's, that's a great example of that. And when you meditate for long periods of time, as you have, you can turn that, uh, need for, um, romantic experiences into a simple need for sourdough bread, uh, as we have recently <laughs> and now your car you've cleared your karma and instead of having you know long periods of time of like you mentioned <laughs> being addicted to relationships and the first parts of relationships now it's just as simple as having a really good fucking loaf of sourdough bread a lot less pain a lot less suffering <laughs> and of course i'm joking but but that's Actually, from my mind, it is probably coming out terribly, but that's a really good example of kind of what you're talking about is preparing yourself for, you know, future experiences of, you know, of physical issues maybe in the future. But like you, you prepare your spirit and you prepare your emotions and you prepare your mind for those future experiences is what I understand. Yeah. I mean, that's a good way to put it. I, I like that. Uh, a, a way I would put th that is... Um, when you become consciously aware in the moment, you're not in your head in the past or the future. And in this moment, without the story of what I'm going to do later tonight or what I did today or what's going on without that story, it is p pure aware, aware, awareness, aware that I'm aware, which is unlimited and unconditionally fulfilled. Gotcha. So... When I'm in that moment, I can eat the ice cream or not eat the ice cream. I can <laughs> eat the sourdough bread or I can not eat the sourdough bread. I can go after the boy or I cannot go after the boy. Yeah. Hopefully it's a man by this point in my life. But, um, we're never men. What's we're that? Nev we're we're never men. We're always boys. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> uh, but, sorry, yes, point taken is, you know, you, you could or you couldn't. It, you're You're in the present moment of – you know, of awareness, not in the attachment or in the pattern of having to eat the ice cream, eat the sourdough. Well, the reason why we have the attachments is because we're in our heads living in the future right. and we're not connected 
we're always connected to awareness, but we're not aware. So we're not consciously aware of the, of the connection. And so when we, we start to feed into the emotions and the fear, then the ice cream tastes really good because it's that pizza theory that I talked about because the ice, ice cream brings us into the now. When I take that first lick or really that first 20 licks of Jenny's ice cream, it's not like the pizza that goes off after a half a piece, but I'm not thinking about what I'm going to do late. I'm just in that ice cream, <laughs> you know, and it's not the ice cream that, I mean, the ice cream is really good, but it's the, it's the uh, present moment, yes. the awareness and not being in the head and fully enjoying the moment. Anyways, we've gone way off topic, but <laughs> it's okay. It's hard. It's, it's tough. And we brought sourdough, uh, romantic situations and Jenny's into it. So, it, you know, I mean, three of the best things on the planet anyway. <laughs> exactly. Arguably, yes, yes, very much so true. So, but yes, I mean, there's there's a lot of way to talk about this. Um, this was a really good angle into it, and there's we we should probably have Brent on I- exclusively to talk deeper about you know uh, astrology, Vedic astrology. astrology, yeah. Because um, I mean, there's there's just so much to learn, and and maybe we'll do that you know here in the future. But uh, in the meantime, check out what he's got going on. Uh, go for a reading. It will never hurt you to go for a reading and just kind of check it out that way because you'll get more in depth, you know, personally from that. And um, but yeah, check him out and yeah, I've got the, I've got his his information in the episode notes in both the podcast version and the YouTube version. And as always, subscribe or even make a comment would be even better because then uh, when you make a comment, then other people can find us um, a little more readily and we can spread the love because that's why we're here. We're spreading the love and the news and the that your happiness is within and in this moment right now. Yes, it is. See you next time. Love you. Love you.